So hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to, to join us. We are so excited and honored to present the fifth class in our Express Offers Training Series, 105 Expert Town Hall. So this is a follow-up series. It's designed to dive a little deeper into our Express Offers custom platform and its successful application into your everyday business. Because of our model, your Express Offers team felt it was really important to give an opportunity to hear from your peers and discuss challenges and, most importantly, successes. Collaboration is the key uh, while we are changing an entire industry. So we need your help making Express Offers a huge success. Stronger, better, faster. It takes a team, and we are here to support you in that success. So this session is intended to provide valuable, usable information in a town hall structure based on real world experience. We hope to give you some ideas and some suggestions, tips and tricks, get into your local market area and start finding sellers that need your help. Anything can be taught from a concept, we get it, but for you to hear the stories and be able to assimilate those experiences into your situations will give you the confidence to construct solid, workable plans and make, hopefully, make 2020, even though we've had a lot of challenges, hopefully make 2020 your best year ever. Guys, consumers are hearing about this across the country, but they need you to give them clear direction, help them navigate the myriad of confusing options. Okay, so today this is a safe place to discuss, ask questions, double check that you get it, right? Most of us in the real estate, in the regular residential real estate lane are not really experienced working with investor clients. And so we're all learning this together. Industry segment is in its infancy, but we feel that we are in a unique place, in a special place, and we're so dialed in and adjusting so quickly. Um, <clears throat> agility, obviously, one of our core values, we, we got that. And so um, we ask experts, uh, our agents across the country to come in and talk to you guys. And so today on our stage, I'm so excited. We have a rock star agent who has experience in the iBuyer arena and is willing to share what she knows with you. So I'd like to welcome Julie Clark, a Washington agent, to our stage. Julie, thank you for your valuable time today. Well, thanks, Terry. I'm excited. Thanks, Julie. Well, you want to tell us a little bit? You know what? Before we do that, let me let me give you Julie's bio so that you know uh, kind of where she's at. So Julie's been an EXP Realty agent for a year, only a year at EXP, and has grown a strong downline of 27 brokers in her first year. And she's got more in the pipeline right now. She leads an AXP community with a deep bench of investor-minded brokers, as well as traditional agents who want to collaborate and learn more about the different options and solutions that they can offer to buyers and sellers in today's market. Um, she is the co-founder of Seattle Investors Club, which has been in existence since 2012. This is a well-respected local real estate investment club where local investors and brokers who work with investors or are investors themselves that flip and fix and flip, buy and hold, new builds, house hacks, multifamily, and more. All of these folks gather for education, inspiration, and fabulous networking. She also is the co-host of a popular national podcast called The Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing with over 120 shows. And she's going to be sharing that link with you um, in, in a few minutes here so that you can um, tune in when, when you have time. Um, the first half of her career was spent at a well-respected local private real estate investment company where they focused on value adds for multifamily and commercial. Julie has two children, and 10 years later, here she is at EXP and loving it. She says that this fits her like a glove. So again, Julie Clark, welcome, and uh, tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, hey, hey, guys. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I think you summed it up pretty well, uh, Terry. Um, what's interesting for me is that I have been running my own personal 
real estate business um, for a long, long time, for years and years and years. Um, and you guys are all, I'll say the traditional agents are just coming to learn about um, this type of uh, real estate today, meaning offering sellers and buyers options um, on how they can buy and sell real estate today. Um, that's how I've been running my business for years, just saying that I specialize in providing options and uh, having a message that now uh, mainstream traditional agents are plugging into, um, which is going to you know, allow them, I'd say, in the future of real estate to survive, right, as our industry continues to disrupt. So yes, my my background. Um, I started in uh, multifamily and commercial real estate uh, with working for a big developer where we bought and held. We would buy, uh, renovate, refinance, and long term hold multifamily uh, properties, office buildings, and so forth. Um, and I was basically the senior asset manager there and a and a partner after about eight years. Um, so I'm used to investing in, in large projects like that. I myself own self-storage, uh, recently bought an RV park that uh, right after COVID hit, got hit by a tornado and wiped out, which is a funny story. But um, uh, I, after I, I worked there about uh, for that real estate investment company for about 16 years. Um, and when I left there, um, I had just had twins. Um, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next. And I had a bunch of money uh, from my real estate investing. And so I thought, let me go flip some houses. So I started flipping houses on my own. And I soon realized that actually the people making all the money were the brokers and the, the lenders, like the private lenders or hard money lenders. Um, so I sort of shifted my focus instead of doing it all myself. I, I now have, I'll call it a flip partner where I generate the off market leads and then he does the flips and we, sub, uh, we split the profits, which is a, a great setup for me. Hard to find, but I've been working at this a long time. And like you said, uh, co-founder of Seattle Investors Club. Uh, which we can all talk about later. But um, yeah, happy to share uh, my own personal business model today, uh, which blends in perfectly with Express Offers. I mean, as soon as Express Offers was launched, I mean, I couldn't wait um, because I know that it's the future of real estate, again, to be able to have those discussions and even better to have a recognizable, respected brand like EXP Realty and Express Offers and all the branding and marketing uh, with all kinds of other agents also marketing the same brings credibility to us when we go out with the Express Offers message. So thanks, Terry and Julie and your whole team for building this platform and, and actually probably saving us, all us agents. Uh, like I say, I think that the future of real estate, it's been disrupting and having access to a platform like this is um, crucial to survival going forward. Yeah, Julie, you know, you, you hit the nail right on the head when you start talking about branding. Um, you know, it's so important. I mean, there are so many brands, there's so many models out there, but, uh, you know, to one of our main goals was to keep the agent in the transaction. You know, I talk about in the training, the big three, you know, they started out trying to cut the agent out of the transaction. Now they figured out that it's important that they bring the agent back in. But a lot of us are already like, yeah, you, you kind of screwed up to begin with. Anyhow, um, you know, so Julie, I really would love to know, um, being in this arena, being involved with investors, wearing all the hats that you've worn, how do you think Express Offers brings value to your business? Well, I'm going to talk in the sense of just like to traditional agents that aren't used to dealing with investors, right? So those of us that have been dealing with investors for a long time, um, you know, this is this is easy for us, right? It's, it's an easy plug-in. Uh, and like we said, helpful um, with credible branding and so forth. But if if you haven't worked with investors or worked off market much before um, and you're looking at express offers and you're wondering, how do I use this? How do I get started? Um, you know, do I need to exclusively use this somehow and start this as a division of my business? 
I'm going to make it easy on you and tell you you don't. It, it is actually just another tool in your toolbox. Um, and what Express offers is, is a tool that allows you to start a conversation. And we all know in lead generation in real estate, the most important thing is just starting a conversation. Um, and the Express offers message is a viable way to start that conversation that's different than maybe the conversation being started by brokers at other firms or brokers that don't understand um, how to essentially send the message of, hey, I specialize in options, right? Um, and so what I, what I think today is, is the opportunity to tell you guys not to focus on this as like something exclusive. It's, it's something to blend into your business, right? So, you know, as an agent, if you get prepared and educated to be able to discuss what options are, all you're doing is starting a conversation and then qualifying that conversation. And if express offers is a fit after you ask them a series of questions, which you would ask any seller, then you can offer that up as an option. Um, if it's not an option because you ask them certain questions that, you know, have you learned that they that their property or their situation wouldn't be a great fit for express offers? You simply just keep the conversation going down a line of other options you can provide them. Like I'll say, for example, you might, you know, put out a message to your sphere. You can put this out to your sphere. You can target sellers that might be great candidates for this. You can do that through cold calls or you can do that through Facebook advertising or direct mail or any of those things, um, you know, and take them down a line of conversation. Um, the beautiful thing I'll tell you about this message is that a lot of sellers I've found, they have no clue whether their house qualifies for a cash offer or not. So, Sellers who, um, it's really more about their situation and it's also about, you know, I guess I'll say the condition of our house. I'm in the Seattle market here and our market, it's still a very hot market and express offers probably isn't a great fit in the core of the city of Seattle because the market's too hot. But the sellers don't know that. They think my house is cosmetically outdated or it needs some repairs here and there. Maybe I should look into getting a cash offer that I'm hearing about everybody talking about these days. Um, and so they will be open to having that discussion. And like I said, you don't necessarily need to care whether they want a cash offer or not because it's just simply part of a conversation that you can move them down a line of other options if it's not a fit for them. Does that make sense? Make sense, Terry? Absolutely. And and do you feel that um, that having that tool in your tool belt, knowing that you can offer that option, don't you feel, Julie, that gives you kind of the competitive edge, gives you something new to talk about, to be able to talk about with sellers other than, you know, I'm the greatest realtor on the planet, you need to hire me? Absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're competing these days on a listing or anything else, um, you know, and other agents don't have a tool as such, they can actually back it up. What's nice about express offers is you might be an agent and you might understand how to work with investors or how to talk about cash offers. But what, what's nice about express offers is there's actually like a credible brand and great marketing and collateral behind it that almost makes you seem not almost it does make you seem more credible right than somebody just saying yeah let me just go call a few people and bring you a cash offer now that that can work too but it does give you an edge that you have i think the brand behind you um you know and a huge website with express offers and so forth like that absolutely yeah and you know i i have to say i get a lot of feedback from agents across the country that um you know this gives them that that new that interesting kind of that trendy conversation it gives them the confidence to start with this conversation something new to get the attention of a seller who might have already talked to one or two or three other 
realtors. And f again, from a competitive standpoint, chances are the other three realtors they spoke to didn't even bring up this option. So as a trusted advisor, your level of confidence, uh, competency, your level of confidence the consumer has in you goes through the roof. Wouldn't you agree, Julie? Absolutely. And I think that as an agent getting started in this, don't overthink it. All you need to do is change your mindset and put into the, the talks and discussions you're having with your clients that, you know what, I actually specialize in options. So let's actually just talk about what your unique uh, and personal situation is and your wants and needs are. And then what I'll be able to do is present you with some options um, for you to move forward or for you to consider so you are fully informed before you make your final decision about how to sell your home. Um, that's how I would go about it is work it into just your everyday, it doesn't matter who you're talking to, um, any seller, uh, or buyer, frankly, because sometimes, you know, buyers have to sell a home in order to buy. So let's not forget that they also can be sellers, right? But working that into just your daily, your, your new way of talking. And if you get used to doing that by saying you specialize in providing options and then asking a series of questions about their unique situation, such as, um, well, tell me about, you know, why are you moving? Well, you know, you want to find out, you know, what is the timing on when they want to move? What are their goals? Is their goal to get the highest price they possibly can achieve for their home? Or is their goal to sell with the least amount of anxiety or hassles or stress? Um, you know, or is their goal to um, not have to spend any money on their home before they sell it? You know, a series of questions that will allow you to engage further with the options right so if somebody if some you know then it comes down to just educating them on if their house even qualifies for a cash offer right because with a cash offer regardless if it's from one of the we call them you know the big three i buyers or through the express offers program or just private investors in the communities um, investors are in business to make money and they need to make a profit. So, you know, those homes will be sold at a discount. So if somebody's going to engage in an express offer or any type of iBuyer offer, they have to be willing to take um, a discount. And so, you know, having that conversation out the gate is, is helpful to know if they even qualify. And honestly, when you start the conversation and say you provide options and you talk about express offers as being one of those options, you actually shouldn't really care uh, necessarily whether they're interested in express offers or not, because it's just one stop on the conversation line. You just keep moving further down the line, right? If they're not interested in express offers, you know, you might say, well, you know, uh, you know, if one of the options is to sell your house as is, or one of the options is to sell your house um, by fixing it up and do like some pre-listing repairs or renovations to your home. And you just take them down that line uh, with anybody that you talk to, and you will land on the place that um, provides the most value to that client. You're a, you're a solutions you provide solutions and options that's how you need to go work going forward with anybody that you any any buyer or seller that you talk to i think oh my goodness i am so hijacking that one julie specialize in options guys anybody in illinois in the chicagoland suburbs i already call it no callbacks you can't use it <laughs> or stealing it <laughs> that that's brilliant absolutely brilliant i think we've got um a uh, couple questions, Julie Rasmussen. Do we have a couple questions in the in the chat box that we can answer? I want to kind of keep up with them because they get buried if we don't. Looks like someone said, "Do you think presenting marketing express offers as the first option is a bad idea?" No, um, I don't at all. Um, I mean, you mean as far as a marketing message? Uh, I don't know, no, Daniel, don't. open up your mic and, uh, Daniel Guerrera. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, your if mic. you're sending like postcards to, uh, 
you know, owners and you're saying, well, you know, we could uh, find a cash buyer for you. Is that a bad idea? Uh, Daniel, great question. It's not a bad idea. Now, when you're doing direct mail, uh, you're spending money, right? And so whenever you're spending money, you want to make sure that you are mailing to a list of, you know, good candidates that might be interested in that. So in that situation, I would, I would try and pull a specific list uh, that could be either you know, uh, driving for dollars type of situation where you, you, you know, drive around your local market and make a list. There's, there's actually apps and stuff that can help you keep track of all that. There's actually something called the driving for dollars app, uh, where you can pin kind of the addresses that meet that. And then you can go, uh, you know, upload that list into a, a mailer list. I'm sure even EXP offers maybe even some one of those services, but, and then you direct mail to a targeted list. And, and when you do that, the best idea is to um, have a layered list, meaning that they have multiple layers of motivation, right? So maybe, um, uh, you know, and I want to qualify that by saying in some states, you need to be a little bit careful because some states have, for example, in Washington state, we have the Washington Distressed Homeowners Act, where um, as you're, if you're an investor, you're not allowed to like send direct mail to um, to distressed homeowners. But as an agent, actually, uh, you can. So that gives you an edge, right? But, um, you know, you want to make sure that you've got a tight list. I'm happy to... Um, talk more about that sort of thing but you know there's ways to do this you could do cold calling off that list which might be more cost effective so you take that targeted list that you've created and you uh skip trace it for phone numbers through red x or vulcan 7 or one of those services or lead sherpa um and you call people uh with the message um, you can do Facebook advertising, like video view ad advertising right now on Facebook is very, um, can be inexpensive and extremely effective um, because there's a lot of people that have backed off on their marketing due to, you know, the COVID situation and so forth. Um, I even heard Zillow's, you know, majorly backed off on all their marketing uh, temporarily, but um yeah, we so actually had the big three completely shut down. They're they're starting to come back out of the woodwork a little bit now, Julie. But for um, middle of March, April, and May, uh, towards the end of May, uh, Open Door started to uh, resurface. Zillow is doing just a little bit, but only in specific markets. So they're not open all the way across the country. Just uh, what did we see, see Julia? I think it was um, Phoenix and uh, possibly maybe Houston, I saw. I, there was a couple communities. North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So, so, so Daniel, I, I would say that, I would say, you know, absolutely you can um, send out direct mail postcards with the express offers message as, le as long as you are trying to narrow and your list down and you are more targeted about who you're sending those to. Um, I personally, at this point, I like using Facebook um, because you can swath, you can throw out a wider net. And if you if you set things up correctly, um, you can have Facebook basically retarget those uh, people that fall into your retargeting bucket through a series of messages. So you can do like a kind of a general summary message about, did you realize, you know, hey, everybody's asking me today, um, you know, about what are the options about selling their house? And um, you might not be aware of it today, but there are many different types of ways you can get your home sold effectively today. And you kind of do just a quick overview of that. And then you chunk it down maybe into three more specific messages all in the like a facebook uh video you know, video view ad marketing set it's cost effective i'm happy to talk about that there's an agent at exp actually that i learned it from and i'm going to give him credit for it his name's josh shanley i think he's out in ohio um so props to him uh is where i've learned some of my marketing stuff from from uh from him but uh yeah absolutely Julie, so um, Karen Cochran has asked, uh, what's the best, what type of seller 
would make a perfect candidate for express offers. And before you answer, Julie, and then she said only only the stress. Before you answer, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you that um, kind of from a general perspective when we're training, you know, we don't necessarily want you guys to target sellers for express offers. It's the opposite. We want you to prospect for sellers and have express offers as a tool in your tool belt to provide an additional option for all sellers. So go ahead, Julie, tell me what your thoughts are on that. Agreed. And I think it's much more effective uh, to do that that way as well, Terry. It's very, very difficult to try and isolate. So I 100% agree with what, what Terry's saying on, on best practices for that. Um, so, hey, Karen, how's it going? Um, um, so ask again, sorry, that distracted me for a second. What's the question again? Well, basically my question, um, and it's not based on targeting, it's based on more when you're talking with a seller, um, what are some of the clues to look for to see if that would be a good, that seller would be a good candidate for express offers? Uh, well, one would be their motivation. Um, and secondarily definitely the condition of their house uh and you know solving a problem for them usually with an i'll say we're always solving a problem when uh typically when we're doing a, a cash offer type of situation and you know what's interesting is it's different across the country so out in arizona in some of these places I, where the big three i buyers are there's a lot of activity on I'll call it pretty house I buyer stuff where they're not looking to that might be somebody that's relocating or they bought another house and they want to close and get their current home sold really really fast and I think a lot of the open doors and stuff are great solutions for that because that's that's what their buy boxes are interested in um, out where we are here, I know Karen, you're in the you're in the Tacoma area. The other the other thing would be like a distressed property that's in need of a lot of work. It's in disrepair um, because you know if it's not, then the discount that the seller would have to take would be would be too astronomical. It wouldn't make any sense for them to to take an offer. So there has to be um, enough enough room for for uh the buyer to make improvements to the house uh in order to increase the value to make a profit when they sell it yet at the same time there needs to not be this huge gap on if the seller were just to list it for sale the traditional route that they'd end up with you know eighty thousand dollars less in their pocket and funny enough because sellers don't understand this sellers that um their house isn't in um that bad a shape will call on this message and that's what my point is it's it's just a message that then don't get focused on whether or not it's got to be a cash offer or not because they're going to call anyways um you know take them down the line of what their other options are so the perfect house in my situation would be somebody that's motivated that you're solving a problem for them um that they don't really have any funds or desire or ability to make repairs or fix up their house um, on their own or with help of their family um, and that you know they want a hassle-free transaction um, that's what you're looking for um, it's harder in the core in the core metropolitan areas and i usually find most of these are going to be in um you know uh i guess i'll say um you know outlying secondary markets i'll say you know that sort of thing so i don't know if it answers your question well but great yeah, perfect thank a, you julie there's a couple of things that i just want to uh, point out again you know and we we kind of beat a dead horse in the training but you know always remember that it's a convenience versus top dollar kind of conversation right um convenience costs money Unfortunately, I mean, that's just the reality of life. And so, you know, you've got a convenience versus top dollar conversation. And the other thing I wanted to point out 
that remember, as the trusted advisor, you guys should know uh, all of the options and be able to present them. And you need to start with defining um, and, and, and knowing what's available in terms of the iBuyer buckets. So back to Julie Clark's point, you know, you've got the big three who are uh, institutional buyers backed by Wall Street money, and they have a very narrow buy box, right? They like they like to cherry pick. They want the cream of the, co uh, the crop. So they want, you know, three bedroom, two bath, uh, 1,500 square feet, $250,000. And I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just rattling off statistics, but, and they don't want a lot of repair, right? They'll do some, but they don't want rehab gut jobs, right? So, and then you've got the, the fix and flip bucket, you know, that you might find in a buy box in express offers. You know, these guys want full-blown rehab. They're not going to come anywhere close to retail, but that's okay. And then you've got buy boxes on express offers that may be buy and hold, which we're getting more of every day. So stay tuned. You want to you want to watch those buy boxes because Julia Rasmussen and I, we've, we've got our process down, man. We're on board and buy, I buyers like our hair's on fire. But right. The, the buy and holds, you know, they are going to look like big three. Um, they don't want a lot, whole lot of rehab. They're going to be looking at their gross rental yield. They're going to be looking at the rental markets in your in your marketplace. You know, are you guys getting good rents? Is Did you find a house that doesn't need a whole lot of rehab? You know, a little lipstick on the pigs and paint and carpet, whatever. Um, these guys are starving. For those kinds of properties so i guess in all of that i'm going to tell you make sure that before you start trying to have these conversations you're fully in touch with what's available to you in your marketplace through not only express offers the big three and as julie clark mentioned your local investment community as well right and a lot of uh buy and hold buyers i know in our market actually will flip to hold as well um, just because we're more of an expensive market out here, um, they force that buy and hold value by by simply just flipping it and then and then holding it. So um, all good stuff, absolutely. I think the the general message is is just you know get used to get used to communicating to people um, that you provide options and then the door opens up for you to take that conversation down a line to solve a problem that matches their unique situation, right? And you can market that message, you know, in many different ways and in many different platforms. Absolutely. So one of the questions that I really wanted to make sure we get to today, because man, this, this, this was a good one. So, um, do you have any suggestions on how agents can prepare sellers for a low offer? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think in the beginning, that's a great question, right? I think it's about being educated yourself in the beginning to understand in the first, in the first part, what kind of offer you might end up getting back. Right. You don't want to the, the biggest way to disappoint somebody is to not understand it quite yourself and then just try and throw one, throw something in there uh, without giving the seller, I think, an idea of a ballpark of what it can come back with. Um, I, I like to communicate with with sellers using like a net sheet before I would even submit an offer. So I'd say uh, the range for the cash offer might look like this, uh, and here's your net cash that you might get out there versus an as-is offer, like, you know, numbers look like this versus uh, what I'll call is a, a boost offer where you go in and, um, you know, there's all kinds of opportunities these days. As you know, Terry, we've been talking about to uh, work with companies that can help do pre-listing renovations and so forth like that. And, you know, that's a conversation. Yeah, we're, we're, we, we, I can't wait till we get to tune in on that one. Yeah, a conversation for another time. But um, there, there's, you know, having that conversation with them about the numbers and what those numbers might look like before you submit the offer um, is, is a way to um, prevent uh, them from being completely disappointed. 
um, you know, if it comes back lower than you think. Sorry, my, right. my, my Alexa just tried to talk to me. Um, so, you know, you know, like I said, if somebody might not qualify and you're going to ask them questions in the beginning, if they say, you know, my, my number one goal is to get the highest possible price I can possibly get. Well, the truth is you never get the highest offer when you take a cash offer. You're always going to be selling your home at a discount when you take a cash offer because investors need to make a profit and that requires a discount, right? And that, like Terry said, the, the trade-off is no hassles uh, and, and maybe less anxiety and nobody in your home, no repairs, leave behind whatever you don't want to take um, versus top dollar. Um, so... You can still, what I do when people say, well, you told me you could get me a cash offer, I'll say, I can certainly get you one, but most likely it's going to be low, and I would recommend that you never take it, right? So now we're acting on the best interest of our client. We're watching out for them, right? Um, you know, if your home qualifies for a cash offer, I can get one. But if you don't reach X amount in offer price from that cash buyer, right? Here's where we're talking about your net sheet. It's probably not worth it for you to take it, right? So we can go ahead and submit it, um, you know, if it's in the zone of what you think you'd take, and we'll see what, what they do. So you just pre-educate them on on that, right? Talk about it. Call and it out. being that trusted advisor, right? Giving them all the options. You know what else is funny? I hear stories from agents all over all the time where they, uh, you know, they suggest this kind of scenario, an express offer, a cash offer, what have you. Seller is um, opposed to it, doesn't want one, or maybe they got one and doesn't like it. And then they experience what you were talking about, Julie, you know, the inconvenience of showing and staging and repairing and cleaning and getting out of your house at dinner time. And, you know, I had a, I was on a webinar with uh, an IT guy the other day. He was with uh, one of the largest MLSs in the country. And he talked about the experience he had in selling his house and he had an 18 month old child. And he said, I would have gladly, and we were talking about iBuyers and Express Offers, and he said, I would have gladly, had I had the option, I would have gladly given up ten dollars to $15,000 worth of my equity to have it done and over with. He said that time in his life was so painful that he would have gladly given up that money to, to, to just get it done, get it over with, and be on with his move. So I find it interesting when I hear these kinds of stories because people, that that's, a, that's their experience. And sometimes it becomes so painful that even if you post an express offers option in the beginning, they didn't like it, they didn't want it, you know, circle back with them in about 90 days and take their temperature on where they sit then. Well, another tip that I, that I use, Terry, and I tell everybody that I – on my squad is that there's a there's a simple non-invasive question that you can ask in the beginning um which is if you don't have the listing yet or you're competing or whatever to give yourself some insight into what your chances are or where you stand with the seller what i always say is if let's say they've i've generated this lead or this conversation off of a cash offer uh message then what i when i'm talking to them what i say is Oh, oh, that sounds great, Mr. Seller. You know, let me ask you a question, uh, Terry. Um, if you don't get a cash offer that, that meets your wants and needs, what's your plan B? Do you have a friend or family member that's going to help you get your home listed for sale? And then I zip it and I say nothing. And they either say, oh, no, I don't know any agents or I don't know. I'll have to cross that bridge. But, yeah, that's probably what I'm going to do. Or they say, yeah, my, my uncle, my cousin, my neighbor is a realtor and I'll just list with them. It's a really insightful way um, to ask a non-invasive question to figure out where you stand from the beginning as you're sussing through, you know, the situation. Hey, Mr. Seller, um, that sounds great. Let me do some research and get back to you on kind of the ballpark of what a cash offer might look like um, and I'll create uh, what I call an estimated net cash uh, proceeds spreadsheet that is going to provide you with a few options. So you'll be fully informed to make 
a decision, right? Because you want to be fully informed before you do that. So, but let me ask you if that, if a cash offer doesn't work out, um, what's your plan B, right? What's your plan B? You have a friend or family member that's going to help you list for sale. It's such a good question. I always ask it. It is a great question, Julie. And by the way, let me just throw out there too, guys. There is a module in the training that uh, explains, not only do we give you the tool, the net comparison spreadsheet Julie's referring to, but we also teach you how to use it. So, and once you've gone through the modules, you can go back into MindFlash and review them again and again and again, uh, as many times as you'd like until you become expert at doing that net sheet. Frankly, and Julie, I don't know if you would agree, but frankly, I think that is one of the most important tasks you perform for a seller. I think that sellers cannot understand when you're talking to them and they're visual. And so you, you absolutely, your net sheet does the talking for you. That is a key, key tool that you need to use when you're communicating because it sets you up for a win, right? It makes it very obvious that, you know, that a listing is going to be in their better interest, right? Um, or, another option such as a you know doing some pre-listing you know i'll call it a refresh or even some upgrades you know there's services out there that that uh you know if the if the seller doesn't have funds to do that themselves that there's services out there i'm just gonna can i say it terry just throw it out there and people can look at it themselves or what's that julie sorry Benching i was typing Carbio. You no, know, I, yeah, I mean, we can we can tease them a little bit, but uh, I want to keep it kind of close to our breasts so that we can get them in as a preferred partner. Okay, and so um, what I, what Terry is talking about, guys, is um, your key tool when it, when you're going through the Express Offers program is your net sheet. It's how you talk and communicate to the seller. Um, number one, absolutely, very simple to do. None of this is complicated at all. Uh, really, it's not. Um, it's just a mindset thing. That's all that this is. Express offers uh, isn't something that needs to be intimidating to you. It's, you know, it's uh, if anybody would like to reach out to me and role play with me in regards to uh, how to talk to sellers or something like that. I'd be happy to to do that or even, you know, jump on a webinar as a group or jump in EXP world or something like that. Um, it's just the idea of opening your mind that you are qualified to do that. And you're absolutely qualified to talk like that if you educate yourself on what the options are of express offers and beyond express offers. All you need to do is know what those options will be. Mm -hmm. And then you can say you specialize in options. And that's as simple as this has to be, right? We can go into talking about, you know, some of the things that you should maybe study up on so you can be a little bit more intelligent on if you really are going to submit to express offers, which you will, you, you know, um, you know, we can talk about that as well. You know what? I think I'm going to, I'm going to just throw something out there. I see a, a little bit of chitter chatter going on in the chat box about wholesaling. And let me be clear that there is absolutely no wholesaling allowed in the express offers platform whatsoever. And here's why. Um, number one, we've got a disclosure to seller document that is uh, the document that's going to keep us protected from litigation. And in that disclosure to seller document, the seller must affirm that they own the house. A wholesaler does not own the house, therefore does not have the authority to sign the disclosure to seller document, which you would need in every single transaction. That is number one. Number two, we are marketing to the consumers that we have vetted cash buyers. And a wholesaler transaction is not a cash buyer. There may be, a, you know, that C buyer may have cash, but most likely they don't. And our transactions need to be um, unconditional and supported by proof of funds letters showing cash. So there's the why, but just so you know, there is no wholesaling at all allowed in the platform. And if we, you know, if we discovered that that's what's going on, we're going to, we'll, we'll remove the iBuyer from our platform. So. And, and let me make it clear also, um, you know, yes, you're talking about you don't want iBuyers wholesaling, you don't want agents wholesaling. Guys, wholesaling is a word 
that is used for people that don't have a real estate license. You don't, you don't need to wholesale. You have a real estate license. It's called brokering, right? And, you know, so for any of you that are, were previously doing that or wondering what that is, uh, it's not necessary. You have express offers. Your, your dreams just came true because you have a platform to, to use to accomplish the same thing. Uh, you know, legally with your license. Well, exactly. And to that point, you know, a lot of our iBuyers relist with you. So once they fix it and it's beautiful and it's back at top of the market condition, you get the listing back. Yeah, it's at a discount. That is true. But you have got a, a top of the market pristine home that's going to attract a lot of buyers you can build your database from the leads created from that marketing of that listing i mean this just goes on and on right but you know julie we're, we're i knew this hour was going to go super quick and so there's there's something really important that i still want you to get to and that is what is your recommendation what do you think the top things are that agents should educate themselves about um you know to help with express offers usage yeah um one of those big things you you would you would I'm making the assumption that real estate agents understand how to pull good comps okay you know what investors care about is their exit value they call it their arv right after their after repair value um and you know so i'm going to assume you guys all know how to comp a property right um but what's the hardest part about probably all this is understanding a little bit more about what renovation costs are um, and that is going to be market by market on what those costs are because the labor costs and so forth are different in every market. And my recommendation to you in order to um, get schooled on that is that you go and plug in to your local real estate investing community wherever you're at and start joining the conversation there or listening to the conversation there. Um, go, you know, what, uh, again, great lead source, right? As well, right? You have investors that some of them these days might want to sell their properties that are, in, you know, just bought a property or just started a flip and they've decided they want to get out of it. Instead, you know, there's a lot of reasons to go plug in there and you can say, hey, why don't I run that by my express offers program? See if we can get you an offer um, if you want to get out of it rather than complete it yourself. So there's one reason to join your local real estate investment club. The other reason is um, to get plugged in and learn from them on what their construction costs are. Um, um, and I think there's a book out there. I'll have to post it in the Express Offers community. It's written by Jay Scott, and it is a estimating rehab costs uh, book that might be helpful for people. Um, I'll see if I can find that, and I'll post it in the Express Offers link if you want me to. I don't have it on me today to do that. That'd be sweet, oh, Julie, if you could oh, put it in there. Oh, it's called The our... Book on Estimating Rehab Costs, somebody just said, by Jay Scott, I believe. Yeah, if you could put that uh, in a post in a workplace group, that'd be super terrific. And also, um, I, you know, like Terry mentioned, uh, I do have a, a podcast and the podcast, actually, the topics that we talk about on the Nuts and Bolts of Real Estate Investing podcast apply nationally. Um, you know, a lot of these concepts and discussions uh, it's a great place. There's so many episodes on there that will help you learn the investor mindset. Um, I know there's one even with our my, a fellow EXP agent and one of the guys in my downline, Justin Stiles, who is a general con. He's an agent, a general contractor, and him and his wife own a design build firm. And we actually talk about construction costs on there. But again, that's for the Seattle market, and costs will be different everywhere. Um, that'd be the number one thing that you want to understand. The other one would be what I call a kind of a deal analyzer, like the numbers um, that go into uh, how a investor backs into what their offer price might be, right? Um, because they have holding costs. So, uh, you know, it's important to understand a little bit about deal analyzer. And I think we have a podcast on that topic as well, like the top 10 or 20 things to, um, you know, um, line items to use in your deal analyzer. Maybe I can find that as well and post it.
Yeah, you know, that would be great, Julie, because, I mean, we cover the math equations in the training, and, I, you know, I try to give them, uh, I try to give the agents just a generalized formula, and if you guys take a look at the buy boxes, the investors um, are encouraged to put their formula in there as well. So, you know, you're going to see things like 70 to 80 percent of ARV minus repairs. Well, there's two huge variables in that equation, right? First of all, are you coming, are you arriving at ARV correctly after repair value? And secondly, are you estimating repairs correctly? So, you know, while you can get a generalized, um, you know, ballpark figure, uh, just based on general guesses, you know, can you build the skills to be able to hone those equations in a little tighter? Yeah, and you know that sounds intimidating to go try to figure out how to think like a general contractor or know those numbers, right? So, like I said, go plug in locally and get a cheat sheet and talk to you know your local investors out there on on so what some of those numbers look like. Um, and keep in mind also that you know investors are in the business of quick turns, right? They want to get it turned if they're a flip. Buy and hold's different, right? But if they're going to flip a property, um, they're going to want to get it sold. So they're going to want to have their exit value, their ARV, just a little under full market price in order to, you know, complete their business model, which is a quick sale as well. They don't want to sit on it and hold it for a long time. So be, be a little bit conservative um, on your ARVs as well on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, guys, we've got about eight minutes left. Man, this just flew by. But I want to make sure that uh, we're getting your questions answered, too. And I, I got a message from my other Julie. <laughs> and, and she doesn't talk much during these because her uh, she's recording for us and her mic doesn't work. But uh, Sierra, I think, had a question. Sierra, you want to open up your mic and, and tell us what that was or ask Julie? Hi, Julie. I always had a question in regards of the options. What was the options again that we give the seller? Yeah, so that could be a cash offer through express offers. It can be an as-is listing, right, where maybe their house needs a little repairs and they want to sell it as-is. Uh, and then the third might be uh, you know, where they do some repairs or refresh or maybe a few, you know, upgrades to their home uh, as another option, which you would think would result in a in a higher a higher market value for them. Right. And that goes back to just that conversation of learning what their special situation is, what their wants and needs are. Um, would be probably the top three. You know, I mean, it can get pretty advanced past that. Um, you know, where maybe it's a, uh, you know, maybe it's a landlord that wants to sell and they don't really need the money, right? And one of the options is to sell and, you know, maybe they might get a higher price if they offer seller financing and things like that. But those are, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go beyond those first three because that will get you where you need to go um, in that respect. Uh, can, I, can I, Terry, can I add in, um, did I answer your question? No, you can add in. Well, I want to. I do want to add in uh, for people who are going to be submitting express offers to the platform. A couple tips to make because you get kind of one chance to communicate. Well, would you like me to say something real quick on that, Terry? Oh, goodness sakes, yes, please do. Okay, so um, you know you're going to be uploading pictures to communicate with the the investor on the other end of the platform, right? With whatever buy box and you've you've looked at, as Terry says, you've looked at your buy box and you've selected the correct iBuyer with the correct buyer box. But once you do that, um, when you take your photos of the house, um, you'll, I, I don't know what the limit is. I think there's a limit on the number of photos and they ask for specific photos a little bit on specific rooms and things like that. But Honestly, you need to communicate a little bit more than that. And so what I recommend that you do is you take a video of the house. And in that video, you want to make sure that you are hitting uh, all the systems of the house, the electrical panel, the furnace or whatever the heating is. Um, if there's any failed windows, 
um, take, you know, if there is, um, you know, a little bit more detailed walkthrough of the house than you're going to have available to you to upload into the photos um, and communicate that to the iBuyer through like a Dropbox link that you can just add in your comments to them. And that will help you communicate better. Plus, you can talk on that video, right? And I find that the more communication that you can have with them, the better. Uh, and, and that allows you to uh, give them the full picture so they're more likely to um, give a cash offer that sticks and doesn't have to have some sort of price reduction when they actually get there and you know see that there's more to do than they thought that they couldn't see just through photos. That's my tip. And a good one it is. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about being the uh, you know the eyes and the ears uh, for the investor, Julie, in terms of you know the quality of a property submission by agents? Uh, you mean like once you're in a specific house, or? Well, I think what I'm getting at is you know if if you're if you're submitting to a buy and hold buyer. Well, then you're going to want to make sure that you give them what you're looking at. So what, what three comps did you use for your ARV if it's a fix and flip? You know, what three rental comps, addresses? I mean, they all have access to the MLS. We get that. But what three addresses are you looking at for rental comps um, so that they're looking at the same data you are? Absolutely. Yes. When you're you're submitting to like a buy and hold uh, buyer and actually, you know, it wouldn't hurt on any express offer just to put those in the notes. Right. Just as a habit to always when you're, you know, is to, to throw in what you think the rental range is um, on that. Uh, but yes, you're right, Terry. Um, you know, for buy and hold investors, like I said, some are going to flip to hold uh, and some are are just looking for. Uh, you know, they all want to know the, the, what the what the repair value is or what those construction costs are. what, you know, that's such a big factor in there. So you want to be super detailed on that. Plus, you're right, provide any type of rental comps or rental information that you can and make a note on whether or not you think that the what the past rent is and whether or not it was rented under market because it was to like a family member or something like that would help, uh, you know, put some context on there. For sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So any uh, any any parting thoughts, Julie, that you would like to share with us? Yeah, the, I uh, want the podcast in the in the chat. Yeah, I, I put a link to the Seattle Investors Club website in the chat and Perfect. the podcast is right on there. And there is loads and loads of information on there on those podcasts. Um, that will steer you in the right direction, like I said, uh, because it's a Seattle Investors Club based podcast and I'm talking to my investors and, you know, our brokers that work with investors, which is now you as well. Um, and I will throw out there, if I can, Terry, that I actually have a weekly online meetup. Um, that anybody can join in. It's um, it's if you go to the Seattle Investors Club, if you go to the meetup.com page and just search for Seattle Investors Club, um, uh, there's a Zoom link there. And every single Thursday morning at 1130 to 1230, we have a peer-to-peer -peer online mastermind and just open discussion about you know, what the hot topics are affecting us as brokers and investors, a lot of talk about lending and messaging, and everybody is welcome to join us. It isn't, you know, just for us here in the Seattle area, um, because all these topics that we're talking about affect all of us, not just us in one specific market, right? Um, and we're all smart enough to know that if we need to do a deep dive in our particular market, then, then we do a deep dive in our particular market. But um, again, join us if you feel like it. We've had other agents from um, across uh, different states on EXP join us and uh, would be happy to have you join the conversation. 
Excellent. Well, uh, Julie, uh, we're out of time, but I want to, you know, uh, as a rock star agent, an EXP attractor, a podcaster, an investor, a mom, I mean, an entrepreneur, you, um, you are a, a guiding light and your information today has been invaluable. And we thank you deeply for taking this time to share with all of us today. All right. Appreciate the invite. You guys can reach out to Julie on if you have further questions and we didn't get to them, you can always put them in the Express Offers Community Workplace feed. We're in there all the time. You can also reach out. Julie, can they chat you if they have questions? Sure. Yeah. You can always send Julie Clark a workplace chat. Um, you know, if you don't want to put a question publicly, you can send a workplace chat to me and Julie Rasmussen. We are, we live in and breathe in workplace chat. So again, thank you, my friend and uh, everybody have a super terrific day. Thank you.